From the Samira Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO and MOG, where we bring together the world's foremost experts, the doctors dedicated to studying it, and the patients who live with it every day. With support from Genetech. Welcome to another episode of the Demystifying NMO and MOG podcast. When I'm scrolling through the NMO and MOG online groups, I see a lot of posts that are talking about medications, therapies, or people that are looking for doctors. But the posts that always strike a chord for me are the just venting posts. Um, People who are coming to the group and they're just looking for a place to talk things out with others who've gone through it, who who may understand what they're going through. And there's no real expectation for a solution. They just need to get something off of their chest and to be heard. You read these posts and, and sometimes we can identify with them and other times, I know for me, I find it unimaginable some of the things that they're going through. It makes me realize how strong we are as individuals and as a community. The weight of chronic illness that we carry every day, it becomes a part of our lives. It becomes a part of us. It's who we are. And we tend to write it off as just the way that things are. But I think it also speaks to an underlying theme of mental health and wellness that we don't really address. We spend so much time and energy focused on the physical part of our disease, we forget to consider what it's doing to us as a person. So for this episode, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Amy Sullivan. She's a staff clinical health psychologist and the director of behavioral medicine at the Mellon Center for MS Treatment and Research at the Cleveland Clinic, where she focuses on the emotional and psychological impact that disability can have on a person, their family, and also the clinicians that take care of them. This is an important topic, so let's dive right in with the word that seems to be everywhere right now, resiliency. Dr. Sullivan, how would you define it? I think that resiliency is a pretty subjective term. And I think when we look at the literature, it's important to take into account that each definition of resiliency is going to have a person's values, beliefs, and ideals. Um, And we have to remember that, you know, the the way that somebody looks at resiliency is pretty subjective. But for me, um, and when I work with my own patients, what it means is it's kind of that ability to adapt to difficult or challenging situations. Um, through the use of behavioral flexibility, mental toughness, and emotional strength. Um, And I love talking about resiliency because when I work with my patients, I always tell them that they are some of the most resilient people that I have ever met. And that is because when people have chronic illness or life's challenges thrown at them, people that go through difficult things tend to become pretty successful Um, at maneuvering these challenges and at building resiliences. So one of the benefits of these difficult situations is the ability to grow in strength and therefore resiliency. Okay, excellent. So is, is resiliency the same as coping? Is it a part of coping? Is that, what's the relationship there? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think how one uses their thoughts and their behaviors to manage their internal and external stressors is coping. Um, So I would say that coping is a skill of resilient people. um, And it's something that resilient people do very, very well. Um, But coping is generally thought to be a conscious strategy or strategies, whereas resiliency is generally a personality trait that one doesn't have to consciously think about. They just go out and do it. So I would think more of coping is a skill of very resilient people. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So you've kind of touched on it a little bit a couple of times, um, but Is someone just kind of born resilient? Do they Mm -hmm. become resilient? Can you build resiliency? Uh, How how does that work? Yeah, I think that in my, from my perspective is that resilient people are people who have likely gone through very difficult things and have kind of figured out how to maneuver their way through difficult challenges. So one of the things that I think about when teaching resiliency or talking about resiliency, because it's very tough to teach resiliency, it's, it's actually something that's, that's built in, as we talked about earlier, kind of a personality trait. But resilient, pe- resilient people have a couple of things in common. And one is that they acknowledge their situation. So however difficult the situation is, they acknowledge it. Um, the second is that they process that emotional uh, piece of the situation. The third is that they cope using individualized coping skills. And that the fourth is that they move forward despite life's challenges. Um, And so I think about this quote from Mark Twain that has come across 
uh, my mind and, and something that I teach very often in my practice. Um, and that is that Mark Twain said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. And I think that resilient people use that. They acknowledge, they process, and then they move forward. As we know, Mark Twain lived to a very long life, uh, years and um, had a very successful life. And, but he was faced with some very difficult challenges throughout his life. And so when he reflected back on his life, he talked about that, that he worried a lot, but that he was able to move forward um, throughout his life. I love it. Um, so like within, the, you, you talked about those four steps. So there's acknowledging it, processing it, um, coping, learning how to cope and using coping mechanisms and then being able to move forward. Is that a linear process or is it kind of all over the place? Can you, yeah, can you that? I, that, that's a great question. So I think what we have to remember is that everybody's going to look at this resiliency in their own lens. And so this is my own theory of resiliency. It's not as if I found this in a textbook. It's This is kind of through years and years of practice with people with chronic illness, what I see. Um, I don't really think that any process in life is linear. I think that it's more of a mountain climb. So sometimes you're going up, sometimes you're going down. Um, and so I think first and foremost, people do need to acknowledge the situation, but then the rest of them, they kind of go at their own pace. Um, the process is, is hugely important to any um, mental health need or to adjustment or to you know going through very difficult processes. Um, and then the moving forward, that's kind of the acceptance piece that eventually happens after you've gone through um, these cycles. But I even think that when, when we think about moving forward with people, sometimes they're moving forward and sometimes they're taking a step back. I don't, I don't really believe in the linear process. I think that we have to just kind of take where one is in their life and, and go with that. Okay. So as, as a researcher, um, is resilience something that's quantifiable? How, how do you study that? Mm. Yeah, I think resiliency is very difficult to quantify. Um, it's, again, it's this subjective um, theme that we see and we hear. Um, it's based on individual uh, principles. Um, and there are so many factors that contribute to resiliency. So for example, if you, if you take two people who have gone through a similar path in life, um, I'm going to use my mom, for example, here. So my mom is an immigrant um, whose father passed away when she was only six months old. At the age of seven, her mom um, brought her three girls across the Atlantic Ocean to America into a brand new country with not speaking the language, with not much. Um, and, you know, they had one suitcase each. Um, and for some reason, her mom had so much grit after having lost her husband and wanted to bring her children to um, America. And on that same boat may have been somebody else in the very similar situation, but their life path may have gone in an opposite direction. So I think that it's about how we look at the world, how we frame our viewpoints, um, the motivation that we have for viewpoints. Um, that all creates resiliency. And so I think when we think about all of the factors that are involved in creating resiliency, it is very, very difficult to measure. That does not mean that there aren't uh, aspects of resiliency that we can measure. I think there are scales that we can use that can measure like psychological factors, um, emotional factors that are quantifiable, but I don't know uh, in particular of a resiliency scale, and I could be wrong, and somebody may uh, post one on your podcast, and I would love to learn about it, um, but it's it's just, I don't think that it's very easy to measure based on the fact that there are so many different life um, situations that go into it. That makes sense. It's a tricky concept to define. And I wanted to mention one more thing, Brian, when we were talking about resiliency um, and how do we build resiliency, I think it's scalable. Um, and, it, and it is that kind of this, this theory or idea, idea that each difficult situation or challenge will most likely lead to more resilience. So um, I don't know that it's quantifiable, but I do think that it's scalable, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think that um, we have to remember that each time somebody goes through something difficult, um, they probably develop more resilience to um, to life's challenges. So it, it, it really is like you were talking about coping mechanisms and kind of techniques to help you process things. 
it it is essentially a skill that as you practice it, you can become more resilient. Uh, yeah, it's a personality factor. I would think of resiliency as the the larger umbrella and the coping skills as um, the, the skills that fall underneath resiliency or the spokes on the umbrella. Yeah. Now, the last couple of years, it's been tough on everybody. There, there's so much, so much divisiveness coming through the pandemic, yeah. not to mention the people within our community uh, that have chronic illness. It's yeah. a lot to deal with, additional stressors. So um, is it possible just to become fatigued from being resilient or even be, become resentful for having to be resilient? Sure. I, I really, I, you know, I see this almost daily in my practice. I think people get very frustrated um, for having to go through what they go through. And one thing topples on top of the other, as you were, you were saying, um, I think people who have chronic illness had a very difficult time with the pandemic. Um, and also like you're describing the dis divisiveness that has occurred. Um, but one thing that I know for sure about resilient people is that their struggles help them to grow. And most resilient people, when they struggle and grow, they use that to help others. So yes, it's, it's appropriate to struggle and it's appropriate to say, gosh, this is such a difficult situation. But when we go back to the steps of kind of going, uh, building resiliency, one of them is one acknowledging that they, that this is a very difficult situation and that they are stuck in, um, some very difficult times at the moment. And then two is processing through them. And when I'm in, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so, um, I have likely the best job in the world, to be honest with you, where I get to, um, walk with people through their most vulnerable times and kind of hold their hand through it and help them to, see how resilient they are. Sometimes people just need, need somebody to help them see their resiliency. Um, and then other times I need to help people to find their way into resiliency. And so um, I just feel so grateful to be able to do the work that I do and that people are willing to let me have uh, you know, a little part of their lives and to share their story with me and to let me go on this uh, their journey of life together. Incredible. One of the first times I had heard you speak was at the uh, the NMO patient day, and you were talking about um, the grief of chronic illness. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know personally, I had yeah. never considered that aspect of, of going through the, the diagnostic process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I think about um, people going through chronic illness is that, that it is a grief and eventually an adaptation model. Um, and the only theorist that I've ever seen talk about this is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, but she talks about it in a different framework. Hers is of death and dying, and people with chronic illness are not necessarily going to die from this. So um, at the end of her cycle of kind of the grief cycle is acceptance. And I think that is important when you're dealing with death, but in the, in the face of chronic illness, most of my folks are going to live very long lives, but they're going to have to adapt um, their lives a, in some way, shape or form. So the way that um, Kubler-Ross talks about her theory, which I've then kind of transitioned into the chronic disease model is that you do go through, and, and we're going to use that kind of mountain uh, terrain is the way that our patients go through this process, but you do process through these different stages of grief. So you may have denial, you may have anger, you may have bargaining, you may have depression. Um, and then eventually you get to that, that place of, of adaptation. Um, and I think that it's important to note that it is not linear at all. It is one of these things where you climb a little and then you fall back down and then you climb a little and you fall back down. Um, and that's okay because we have to be willing to accept the fact that, that that's how life is, right? It's, it's rocky at times. And then sometimes the terrain is beautiful and sometimes you get to see a waterfall and then sometimes you come down the side of the waterfall and then you go back up. Um, and that's life because people with chronic illness are not just going to be managing their chronic illness. They're also going to have life stressors that come at them as well. And I think that we have to acknowledge that, you know, over life, things are going to be challenging and we have to learn how to, to kind of manage those different situations. So when I think about uh, chronic disease, I think about it in terms of this grief and acceptance slash adaptation model that I think is so profound. Um, and uh, although it wasn't written for somebody with chronic disease, the theory certainly fits. Um, and it's something that I work 
through with my patients on a very regular basis. When you're having a bad day, do you have a go-to strategy or technique to help you kind of get refocused and, and moving forward again? Yeah. Oh, I have several of those. Um, so one of the things that I love the most is a technique called mindfulness. And mindfulness is really learning how to be in the present moment. So mindfulness is not thinking about the future, which can cause anxiety and it can cause you to feel very stressed out and not thinking about the past, which can bring about, you know, remorse, regret, depression. Instead, it's living in the present moment and looking at the present moment as a gift. Um, and when we think about mindfulness, it's also learning how to really take in where you are at that present moment. So the way that I do this is by way of using my five senses. So if I'm starting to think about, you know, what's coming at, you know, four o'clock today or uh, next four weeks or whatever, um, it stresses me out, to be honest with you. So I have to learn how to be in the present moment and how I do that is a centering technique that I use and I use my five senses. So I try to figure out, you know, I'll, I'll usually sip on a, a cup of tea um, and I'll, I'll say to myself, you know, what am I smelling? What am I feeling? What am I tasting? What am I hearing? And I go through that and then I center myself and it brings you right into the present moment. And it is one of my very, very favorite techniques for uh, kind of centering myself and um, being in the here and now. Fantastic. Awesome. Wellness is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's just getting larger every year. And if you walk into a bookstore or you're looking through podcasts, the, the listings of for pop psychology, it's just, it's everywhere. Um, any advice on helping people sift through just the, the glut of information that's out there? There's a lot of information and realistically, not a lot of it's necessarily good information. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I have seen a lot of pop psychology as well. And these are, you know, I'm glad that people are interested in psychology and um, are writing about it. But, you know, I think it's important to recognize that when, you know, somebody that's a trained psychologist has gone through decades of training to get to where they are. And um, we use very theoretically based um, knowledge. Um, most of us are kind of, we, we are clinicians, we are researchers, we are, we're educators. And so we, I think it's important for us to stick to people and um, to stick to the to the empirical knowledge, um, I think wellness is is though it's very individualized. And so when I think about um, wellness, one of the things that comes to mind is that you have to be motivated to um, want to to be well. Um, and so I would say if someone's motivated to be well, um, they find a trusted reference or a, a trusted um, person, um, and they try to find what fits their lifestyle. And some of the areas of wellness that are most important to me are, of course, physical health, um, and that would include like your biometrics, um, mental health, um, sleep, and self-care are very, very important to me. Um, and so I try to teach that with, with our patients. And of course, I know, you know, Dr. Renzel and Dr. Renzel is our neurologist who is very much focused on wellness with her patients. And so um, I admire the work that she does and the teaching that she does in this space. Um, and so she's somebody really, um, I think you'd want to read anything that she puts out there. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, I mentioned the word motivation earlier, is that if someone has a hard time getting motivated. Um, and I know we all have these moments in our lives where we're kind of like, I can't get motivated. What do I do? Um, something that you know I've learned is that we need to set these small achievable goals. Um, so when you feel success and when you see that small goals are moving forward, it's very motivating and it helps us to move forward. Um, and if you're having a difficult time with motivation, there is this uh, theory that I love. It's called motivational interviewing. And um, motivational interviewing is a communication um, or counseling tool um, that really helps a person to become motivated based on their own wants, needs, values. Um, and there are trained psychologists and therapists out there who do this technique very well um, and helps people to become motivated or to figure out why they're stuck. Interesting. I've, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to, you want to throw in there um, before um, we go? 
think the only thing I'd like to throw in there is I think that when people go through chronic illness, I think it's very normal to need to reach out to somebody in behavioral medicine or mental health. Um, these are people who are skilled at helping people to deal with the anxiety of their diagnosis or the adjustment to their diagnosis or fear of the future. And we're skilled in different areas of um, helping with, with um, you know, the, the psychological needs of the person with chronic illness. And when I think about um, behavioral medicine or mental health, you know, 10 years ago when I started in this field, it, there was such a stigma attached to it. And now what I've realized is that, you know, it, part of my life's work is, is breaking that stigma. So um, I think it's important that we normalize that, you know, everybody needs to take control of their mind just as they take control of their body. And the mind is such an influential organ um, that we have got to take care of. And, and it's, it impacts every area of our life. And so our mental health is just as important as our physical health. And so I just wanted to make sure that people um, people are aware of that. I'm, I'm glad you bring up the stigma. I spent most of my young life as, as a paramedic. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was at the time, the idea of stress, stress debriefings had started to be one of the tools that we had in helping deal with things, but it wasn't necessarily widespread. And even like within my peers, it wasn't something that we talked about. It wasn't something we wanted to talk about just for the fear of um, losing shifts or kind of getting benched, if you would. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the, the stigma of, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so had a bad time in that call. Um, he can't do this work anymore. Or, you know, she's having a hard time dealing with that. And it was always something that that we just, we knew it was there. We didn't talk about it when we ignored it. And yet now my friends um, who are still in the business, it's on the forefront. It's something they focus on. There's programs. It's something that they talk about frequently and they really try to address and so overcoming that that stigma around mental health and mental wellness is is so important. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. And I'm really glad to see that things have changed. I know I was talking to my colleague this morning about compassion fatigue and how difficult that is in the medical field and just what you were talking about, the, the trauma associated with what you've seen in your field is probably much worse than what I've seen because you're on the front line. But even so, in our practice, when you lose a patient, it's it's losing a part of you. Um, and we get so attached to our patients and we our patients are so much more to us than just a number. Um, you know, we think about them at night. We think about how we can change, you know, an outcome. Um, we we want the best for them. And, you know, we're we're also against a lot of constraints um, just from a systematic, uh, pressure. And so it's just like we we, that compassion fatigue is something really real and something that I think that, uh, people are starting to, to really dive into and accept and talk about and, and, uh, give skills to people like myself uh, in medicine or you, um, in your field. And it was in with paramedics, gosh, Gosh, thank you for the work that you do and to all of your colleagues, because I can't even imagine how difficult some of the stuff that you've seen is, but I'm so glad to hear um, that they are now addressing the, the psychological needs that need to be met. Well, that was an awful lot to cover. And I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. I feel Absolutely. like we could probably talk for, for hours more on this topic. There's so much, so much to it. So again, I thank you for for coming out and talking with me today, and uh, we will hopefully talk to you in the future and and learn more. All right, thanks so much for having me, Brian. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye bye.